we have the Lord's Prayer. Now, it's actually misnamed. It should be called the Disciples' Prayer, or the prayer the Lord taught the disciples, or the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our, our sisters and brothers over in the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches call this the Our Father, uh, because that's how it begins, Our Father who art in heaven. The two biblical versions of it, uh, today in Luke's Gospel, it's kind of a minimalist version of it. Over in Matthew's Gospel is the one we're more familiar with, the one upon which our modern uh, Protestant versions of the Lord's Prayer that we pray you know, pretty much every week in church, and many of us pray every day in our private prayer time, is based. We're going to take a look today at the Lord's Prayer, but let's start with that bare-bones version that we have in Luke's Gospel. Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us, and do not bring us to the time of trial. Yes, you can see this is a, a framework, a, a bare-bones, an unadorned version of the Lord's Prayer. We're going to take a look at it. We're going to look at it more, however, as we find it in our daily prayer, as we pray it here in church, as you find it more like over in Matthew's Gospel and in the traditions that have governed us in our worship life because more important than anything else has been the way in which this prayer has been prayed by Christians across the centuries because it has been prayed by Christians since the first century until now. This prayer that Jesus taught his disciples have been, has been prayed again and again in many different contexts, in morning prayer, noonday prayer, evening prayer, the prayers just before bed, in worship on Sunday mornings and Sunday evenings. Every time you go to the table of the Lord, this prayer is prayed. But you see, it's more than just a prayer we are to pray. It's a way of prayer, a pattern of prayer. It's entitled, intended to teach us how to pray. For after all, that is what the disciples asked. Teach us how to pray as John taught his disciples to pray. Teach us how to pray. It's a way of praying more than it is just a prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven... Hallowed be thy name. That's the first part of the prayer. We begin by addressing God as Father, and we give praise to God who is worthy to be praised. Hallowed, holy, blessed be your name. Now, this is actually a very Jewish prayer. Instead of naming God specifically, instead of saying Yahweh Elohim, the God's personal name, the Jews would avoid that and say Lord or Father even. And here we have Jesus using this intimate method, this intimate mode of addressing God, the creator of the universe, as Father, something that he does repeatedly in all four Gospels. He dresses God as Father. At one point, he was asked about his identity and his nature. Over in John's Gospel, he even said, I and the Father are one. He makes these references to God as Father. And this is a reference to the the nature of God in, in God's loving and parental character. We see that in the illustrations that, that Jesus pulls uh, after he teaches this prayer. When he talks about uh, a father doesn't give a scorpion or a snake when a fish or an egg is asked for. The, a father gives the children what the children need, not something horrible. Likewise, God the Father God, our Creator, God, our loving Parent, God gives us that which we need. And so we should address and relate to God as Father, as parental deity. Now, I pastored a church not too long ago where I had a church member, and every time we would pray the Lord's Prayer, I looked at it and I saw her, and I watched as she would cringe every time that prayer would begin with our Father. I got into the habit of not saying Father frequently in prayer, principally because every time I would see it, she would flinch or she would cringe like she was being slapped. And I remember talking to her not long after I got there, after I'd noticed this, and she said to me, well, when I grew up, my father wasn't loving. My father didn't protect me. My father would slap me every time he saw me. And it made me realize that for her, parental deity isn't loving as a father. It might be judgmental, punishing, but not loving. And so, in talking with her, she said, would it be possible for me to say, 
mother because that was where she had her sense of nourishment, nurturing, protection, and loving was in her mother's warm and safe embrace. And I said, that's the point, that God is the one who gathers us in, who loves us. And there's biblical images for this. One of the images for God is uh, a mother bird sheltering the chicks, her chicks under her wing. One powerful biblical image for God. So I said, there's Bible for that. But the important point is that we relate to God, the creator of this amazing universe, like we ought to relate to our parents who love us and cherish us, give us life, give us guidance and protection. Indeed, that's what this whole prayer is about. The prayer to the one who gives us what we need, who gives us guidance, who gives us love and protection. So our Father who art in heaven, hallowed, holy, blessed be your name, is how we begin this prayer, recognizing who God is for us, what God does for us, and praising God for being God. Because we need to give blessings and praise to God. God, our parent. God our Father, God our loving Heavenly Mother. Thy kingdom come, the second part, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now we should begin by praising God and addressing God as Father. Then we should profess our allegiance to God. We are, we are for what God is for. We are proclaiming that what God wants to be done is what we want to be done. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. These ideas are held together. They mean that we are part of God's realm. We are part of God's nation. We are part of God's community. We are part of God's tribe. We are part of God's family. That word kingdom, it comes from the word for king, who is the head of a kingdom, but embedded in that is the Old English word kin, family. We are God's next of kin. Thy kingdom, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We, we want God's will to be done here and now in our lives, not just in heaven, but here on earth, in our lives, and we will participate in His kingdom coming in the here and in the now. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Not tomorrow, today. Not in the sweet by and by, but in the here and now. Part three, give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. <laughs> the, um, <clears throat> the Pope was having uh, drinks with um, uh, Colonel Sanders and some of you know this joke. And Colonel Sanders says, Pope Francis, I will give you a hundred million dollars if you will change the Lord's Prayer from give us this day our daily bread to give us this day our daily chicken. And the Pope says, oh, no, that's not enough. That's just, that's just too much to ask. And Colonel Sanders scratches his little goatee and he says, Oh, okay, I'll give you a billion dollars. If you'll change, give us this day our daily bread to give us this day our daily chicken. The Pope says, I'll have to think about it and pray on it. So he goes away. The next day, Pope meets with the College of Cardinals, and he says, my brothers, I found a way of getting the church a whole billion dollars. The only problem is we're going to lose the account with Wonder Bread. 
give us this day our daily chicken. No, give us this day our daily bread, our daily bread. The image here comes from the manna in the wilderness. The Israelites were wandering in the wilderness. They were starving. God showered the what is it bread, the manna, daily upon them. And they could gather up only as much as they needed for the day. If they gathered more, other than the day before the Sabbath day, if they gathered more than what they, than what they could eat in one day, the next morning it would be moldy and full of worms. Blech. But if they gathered what they needed just for that day, they could eat. And they would have enough for the day of basic sustenance, because that's what bread was. Bread and water, basic sustenance. And Jesus calls himself the bread of heaven, the true bread of heaven. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. Eat from me and you will live forever. And I am the living water. He uses this imagery of himself here. We are called to pray for, in this prayer, give us this day our daily bread, the basic sustenance that we need. Hmm. You mean I can't pray, give us this day my daily pizza? No. My daily chicken? No. My daily four-course meal? No. My daily chicken fried steak with mashed potatoes and gravy? No. My daily fried catfish? No. My daily shrimp with bacon wrapped around it? No. Give us this day our daily bread. What we need, what we need for right now. And forgive us, part four, and forgive us our trespasses. Well, here we got an interesting question on translation because different versions render this differently. Even in today's version, we get this, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who are indebted to us. And the, and the, the old joke used to be that, that you know, Methodists and, and Baptists and all, well, Baptists were, excuse me, Methodists were Baptists who could read and Presbyterians were Baptists who could read and had air conditioning. And the Presbyterians were always interested in money, therefore they talked about debts, Give us this, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are indebted to us, is how you will read it over in the Presbyterian, our brothers and sisters in the Presbyterian church. Our friends in the Roman Catholic church, Episcopalians and Lutherans, will sometimes say sins. Well, even we can do that. But the traditional term for Protestants is trespasses. Forgive us our trespasses. Now that's wonderful. We know we need forgiveness. We know we are sinners. We know we need to be forgiven. That's why we prayed a confession of sin at the beginning of the service today. We know we need to be forgiven. Can I get an amen? amen. Whew, at least all of you said that. First service, Brian said it alone, and I had to have the rest of them say it again. <laughs> we know we need to be forgiven. Can I get an amen? amen. Oh, wow. Forgive us our trespasses. Yeah. Yes. As we forgive those who trespass against us. Oh, Jesus. That's hard. Did you hear what it said? Forgive us our trespasses as, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Let's, let's use the word sin instead. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Ooh. Let's be Presbyterian for a moment. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Ooh. Do we really do that? Do we really realize what we're praying when we pray this? And we pray this prayer almost by rote. Most of us could pray it asleep. I, prayed it in my sleep several times in church. Trust me, I know. Personally, I see my own experience. Morning prayer, noonday prayer, evening prayer, song. I remember, I, I remember one time, it was uh, during the first few weeks that I was here back two years ago, Wednesday night evening service. We normally say the uh, Lord's Prayer after the great Thanksgiving in the Eucharist. 
in the Anglican service, and we had switched to the sung Lord's Prayer. And so we had finished singing the Lord's Prayer, we had the breaking of the bread, and I was communing my assistance, and Karen looked at me and said, we forgot to pray the Lord's Prayer. We had sung it. We had forgotten to pray. No, we had sung it. We go it by rote so frequently that we don't even hear what we say. We get used to certain patterns. Then when you change it, it throws you for a loop. Do we actually hear what we pray? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us? You mean I've got to forgive to be forgiven? Uh, yeah. Well, I thought Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. He did. But if we refuse to forgive, we clog up the ability in our spiritual arteries to receive forgiveness. We make it nearly impossible to receive forgiveness when we refuse to forgive. I can't tell you the number of times I'll be counseling somebody about this deep sense of not feeling forgiven. That they, they're struggling with forgiveness and they don't feel forgiven and they've begged for forgiveness repeatedly time and time and time and time again. And then when I talk to them and, I, and I, we, we talk about their life and I ask them to talk about the things that have happened to them, we come across some really horrible things that have happened to them. And I finally ask, well, did you forgive so-and-so for what they did to you? And they looked at me and said, what? It turned out they were holding, gripping hard onto this sin, this horrible thing that had been done to them by a friend, a, a family member, a, a, a relative, they were, they, a teacher, they were, they were hanging on to this sin, they were hanging on to this wrong, they were hanging on to this trespass, and they would not let it go. And because they didn't let it go, they were never open to receive forgiveness. And therefore, they had never experienced what it meant to be forgiven. And so, for them to be forgiven, they had to first be led in forgiving someone else. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Well, I don't want to forgive them. We don't have that choice. We don't have that choice. Jesus is pretty clear. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. I'm <laughs> I have a friend named Ruth. She's a dear, sweet soul. She's a wonderful person, a fabulous Christian, dear friend of mine. I love to go cruising with her on the open ocean. I look forward to doing it next year sometime. And, and it, 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 one day, she was talking about this. We were having a joke about this. And she said, when I pray that in church, sometimes I say, and lead us not into temptation, but let's save that one for tomorrow. <laughs> for right now, I really want to dive into temptation. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The, the version in Luke just says, and do not bring us to the time of trial. You know, we need guidance. We need God's provision and protection like a mother, like a father leading us helping us and protecting us and leading us away from temptation, from the trials, from the pitfalls, from the mistakes that we've made as adults. We want to protect our children from stumbling the same way. We're praying that God the Father would lead us away from temptation and deliver us from evil. I love how the Eastern Church will often say, and deliver us from the evil one. Sometimes it really seems as though that evil is more than just a thing, that it's some ravenous lion out there ready to consume us. Lead us not into temptation. 
The things that tempt us are great. And that wonderful, loving creator God that we have, this parent God that we have, this loving God who formed all that is, and we praise this loving God who comes to us and gives us our daily bread, this loving God who forgives us as we forgive. This loving God will lead us and guide us. That's what we're asking for. So you see, you have a number of specific things you're asking for. You first pray and identify God and praise God and and, and align yourself with God's will. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Then we ask for what we need, our daily bread. Then we ask for forgiveness and affirm that we are going to be forgiving. Then we ask to be guided away from temptations and delivered from evil. And then, of course, in the Protestant tradition, we add on that little doxology, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. It's not found in the biblical versions and the oldest copies. You'll find it in the King James because it was found in the Geneva Bible before it, and it was found in the Geneva Bible because the Church of England had it as part of their liturgies for years and years and years. Hmm. We pray this prayer to orient ourselves towards God, our Heavenly Parent, toward God's will in this world, to opening ourselves to expressing our need to opening ourselves to forgiveness and to forgiving others, to open ourselves to being led away from temptation, to open ourselves to being defended from evil. This is a pattern for prayer. Yes, we pray it. Sometimes we pray it by road and don't hear what we pray. But it's a pattern for prayer. It is called to guide us in our praying. In other words, we could pray very similarly in this basic structure, very simple prayers. God, we thank you for being with us this day. We thank you, O Heavenly Father, for the blessings you give us. We thank you for being our Creator and our God. We we recognize your will for us, we align ourselves to it. We have these needs. Loretta is sick. Harry is sick. The world is struggling in war. Bring us your peace and your healing touch. And God, we have so many things that we need to let go of, these pains and these anguishes. We need to forgive and we need to be forgiven. And lead us, Almighty God, in the way you would have us walk and doing what you would have us do and protect us from the powers and forces of darkness in Jesus' name. You see, it's a basic structure for prayer. That's how we're called to pray. One of my biggest frustrations with preachers, Brian, is that we tend to get together in groups and then we try to impress each other by the length of our prayers. (laughs) Went to lunch one day with a ministerial association group in some other town that I will not name, and there was a preacher there. And he got up, they asked him to pray, and everybody goes, oh, no. And so, old brother Jim gets up and he starts to pray. And he prays, and he prays, and he prays, and he prays, and he prays. And, and, you know, minutes pass until suddenly the preacher across the table from me leans across and says, you can start eating now. He'll go on for a while longer. (laughs) Just say amen around the salad. No. Simple like this is what Jesus told us to do simple like this may we truly be open to God our creator our loving eternal parent may we be truly aligned to God's will and open to what God would have us to do may we be truly open to what God gives us and ask for what we need for others. May we truly be forgiving and accepting of forgiveness. And may we truly be led away from temptation by the Holy Spirit of God. For truly, 
Lord God, thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the been listening to a sermon by Dr. Gregory Neal, Senior Pastor of the First United Methodist Church in Commerce, Texas, and Rector of Grace Incarnate Ministries. Copyright 2016 by Dr. Gregory S. Neal. All rights reserved. For more information and for other sermons by Dr. Neal, visit us on the web at www.revneal.org. That's www.revneal.org. You are also invited to visit us in person at First United Methodist Church, 1709 Highway 24, Commerce, Texas, 75428. This program was produced by Dr. Greg Neal.